Welcome to the new and improvised uh, David Silverman event. <laughs> Thank you for pulling chairs around and, and making do like we are. Um, yeah, so I'm a little flustered. Uh, I'm Jennifer Goulet, for those of you who don't know me, uh, co-founder and president of Tri-City Freethinkers. And uh, we are really excited to have David Silverman here today. It's been over a year in planning and thank you very much for coming. Thank you for being flexible in this. Um, and sorry, I've been literally running all over the place. Um, I want to especially thank all of our financial and other supporters because without you, this would not be happening today. And I really want to thank my board members who have been, uh, boy, I know you guys have been running around as much as I have these last few weeks and thank you very much for it. Um, as for David Silverman, um, he's the, in case you don't know, the firebrand uh, president of American Atheists. Uh, he is the, you said, executive director and original... Uh, creator and executive producer. Creator and executive producer of the Reason Rally, which uh, this year coming up, there's the second ever Reason Rally. The first one had 30,000 people in the rain. Well done. Uh, so David, you may have seen him on Fox News. He's been on Bill O'Reilly. He's been on Sean Hannity. He's the one that gets wedged in between the Jew and the Catholic and they shout over him. Uh, <laughs> we won't shout over you today. I appreciate that. If you do, you will be escorted out. <laughs> I've had enough today. Uh, <laughs> I am fed up, okay. Um, he has a new book that is coming out December 1st. It is called Fighting God, an Atheist Manifesto for a Religious World. Um, it makes the case, and he will make this case today, uh, that telling people God doesn't exist and religion is a lie is not only effective, but downright nice. And so please pre-order that book on Amazon.com, if you will. Uh, if you go to smile.amazon.com, you can support the Tri-City Freethinkers through your purchase. Uh, we appreciate it if you do that. And without further ado, <laughs> David Silverman. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you to the board of directors of the Tri-City Tri Freethinkers. And thank you all for coming. Can you all hear me if I talk in a normal tone of voice? Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Uh, did somebody say no? Everybody can hear me? You in the back can hear me if I talk like this? Okay, so you in the back are going to hear me. This is what it's going to be. So, uh, really glad to be here in Portland on this beautiful, beautiful day. And this isn't Portland, but I'm going to Portland next. This is Washington. This is Washington. That was a test to make sure you're all awake. Congratulations. You all passed. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is David Silverman. I've been president of American Atheists now for about six years. I've been an activist in the atheist movement for about 20 years. And over the course of those 20 years, uh, I have really learned the value of firebrand atheism. Um, I've always been a firebrand. My firebrandism started back in my college years, marching for pro-choice. But really, it's come to a good gelling as I've been an activist for American atheists, as I said, for the past two decades. Um, I've written a book. Uh, it's called, Fi it's called uh, Fighting God. And uh, it is the first ever book published by a career atheist to be published by a major publisher in this country. My publisher is Macmillan. Uh, they're one of the largest public publishers in the world. Um, and that kind of uh, lends another aura, another status of the, of the book. Um, and I'll get into why that matters in a little bit. First, I'm going to talk about, well, what I'm going to talk about, which is the agenda for today. What exactly is firebrand atheism? How is it defined? When people say firebrand atheism, what exactly are we talking about? And then I'm going to give some examples. Examples of firebrand atheism in person and in mass. And I'm going to make the argument that firebrand atheism is effective, more effective in person and more effective in mass. And I'm going to do something that a lot of people don't do, enough people don't do. I'm going to back up my claims with a thing called data. I actually have, check this out, data from independent multiple sources to corroborate my claims. I know, it's crazy. But that's the way I do things. 
Uh, and then finally, results, results, and more results. We have a lot of results. Again, quantifiable results. Definite, quantifiable, definite. Quantifiable results that I can point to. Correlation isn't causation, but I got a lot of correlation to show you. And finally, I'm going to show you how firebrand atheism can work for you and why it should work for you. First, let me go into exactly what firebrand atheism is not. A lot of people think firebrand atheism is being rude for the sake of being rude. And it's not about that at all. I'm going to make the argument that firebrand atheism is kind. Firebrand atheism is nice. More importantly, firebrand atheism is humanistic. I'm going to make that point. But before I get there, let me tell you what it's not. Uh, it's not insulting people. It's not insulting people. It's not insulting people by calling them idiots, brain damaged, or derogatory names. Insulting people, as we all know, is the mark of a weak argument. We do not have a weak argument. We have a very strong argument. And if we have a very strong argument, we need to use that strength and leverage that strength. If we resort to the, uh, to the tactics of a weak argument, we, come, we become as vulnerable as those weak arguments. We're not talking about getting in people's faces. We're not talking about screaming, browbeating in an attempt to convert. We use facts and data because we have facts and data. That's what makes our arguments strong. If we didn't have facts and data, we'd browbeat, we'd brainwash like religion does, and then we would be no better than religion. But at least here, when we're talking about atheism, we have facts and data, and that's what we use. Firebrand atheism is also not defending or promoting atheism with dogma or law. Atheism must be understood via critical thinking and hard data. Otherwise, it's just memorized and regurgitated, again, like religion. I kicked off this tour, this, the, the Fighting God book tour, in China a few months ago. And in China, they had mandatory atheism. But it was dogmatic atheism. It's the standard, stereotypical, communistic type of atheism. And all you had to remember was that there is no God. There was no data behind it. There was no, this is why we know there is no God. There was just, this is the rule, there is no God. And when you do that, what happens? Well, we're seeing it happen. In China, they're relaxing their laws. And what is happening? A huge influx of Christianity and Islam is flooding into China right now because they are not armed with the critical thinking skills that we are armed with. They're armed with the dogma of there is no God. And if, you, if all you have is dogma, well, dogma can be replaced by other dogma very easily. That's why it's vulnerable. That's why we should never be pushing atheism by law. We should never be pushing atheism by dogma. We should be pushing atheism driven by critical thought. So let's talk a little bit about what firebrand atheism is. Firebrand atheism is best described in five points. The first point is tell the truth as often as possible. This is, number, this is point one. Tell the truth as often as possible. This is a hardline atheism. And point one is tell the truth as often as possible. Emphasis on the word tell. Because silence often implies agreement. And too often we don't tell. We stay silent and we pretend we're not lying, but we are. If somebody says, and we all know there's a God, and you're like, that's agreeing that we all know that there's no God. That is agreement. That is lying. Firebrand atheism point one is tell the truth. No, there is no God. We don't agree on this point. That's number one. All gods are, tr are false. All of them. That's a fact. That's the truth. All religions are lies. All of them. That's the truth. We know this. We can see it. And respect is earned, and religion hasn't earned any. The fact that somebody believes in something doesn't mean that that idea has respect. That's the truth. Simple stuff. Point one, tell the truth. Silence implies agreement way too often. That's number one. Number two. Don't feign respect for the unrespectable. C.1. Because if you're feigning respect for something unrespectable, what are you doing? You're lying. You are lying. And this is something that we need to internalize. That we do not have to respect it, and we do not have to feign 
respecting it. Because faking respect for something that you don't respect is lying. And we do that way too often. Point three. Don't accept inequality as acceptable, even if it is the norm. In God we trust. One nation under God. It is the norm. What? Oh, it is the norm. It is the norm, and it is not acceptable. If we accept this kind of privilege, this level of privilege, as the norm, and we just let it pass off, and we don't object to it, we are feigning respect for the unrespectable. We are not telling the truth. Inequality is not acceptable. Second class citizenship is not acceptable. Saying it is, or, or staying silent when somebody else says it is, is lying. It is not telling the truth, and it is not firebrand atheism. And it is not going to accomplish anything at all. Point four. If someone claims to be offended by your truth, it is because they're used to this norm. They're used to this inequality. They're used to this privilege. And they can tell you that they get offended when you attack their religion. So many times that stops atheists from talking. Oh, I don't want to offend anybody. Well, that's crap, ladies and gentlemen. We are allowed to tell the truth. It is not immoral to tell the truth. It is not wrong to tell the truth. And it is not an attack on people to tell the truth. It is an attack on lies to tell the truth. So when we are told that we are offending somebody because we are telling the truth, we need to respond with, well, look, you know what? I know you're a Christian, Jew, Muslim, but that's only part of what you are. I'm not insulting you as a person. There's a piece of you that I disagree with fervently. And that's what I'm talking about. I'm not saying you are an idiot, because they're not. Religious people are not idiots. But so often they're brainwashed, and that is the word here, folks, brainwashed into thinking that their identity comes from their religion. You are a Christian. You are a Jew. You are a Muslim. From childbirth. It's natural for them to have that. And we need to expect it and respond not with anger, but at the same time, not with acquiescence, not with dishonesty. We need to take it on and explain to them that they are many things, only one of them is religious, and that part is wrong, simply incorrect. And number five brings up my friend Muhammad. By the way, for the camera, I do represent that picture as a drawing of Muhammad, the prophet of Islam. Now, just to let you know, if someone tries to limit freedom using their religion, do points one to four only louder. Okay. So a lot of people, they get all upset when I put Muhammad up on the screen. Why are you doing this? It's just going to make people angry. Folks, we do not draw Muhammad just to make people angry. If we were drawing Muhammad just to make people angry, we would have been drawing it all along. But when the Danish cartoons incited riots, we, were, we had this law inflicted on us as a society. We, as a society, began to obey Islamic law under threats of retaliation. We said, oh, no, 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 no. If you draw Muhammad, they might shoot somebody. You better not. And now all of us in the, as a country, not all of us, but as a country, we caved into that pressure. We yielded to terrorism. That's what it is. When somebody says, do what I say or I'll blow some shit up, that is yielding to terrorism. So why is that OK? If you go back, if you do a Google search and go back to those Danish cartoons, the early ones, you'll see all the signs being held up by all the protesters. They all say the same thing. You will not draw Muhammad. That was five years ago. Now, the signs have changed. If you Google the search, searches now for Islamic protests, you will see it says, you will not insult Islam. This kind of progress, or lack of progress, this regression happens in baby steps. The reason you don't yield to terrorism is because it's never the end. If you yield to terrorism now and you say, okay, well, we as a country are going to decide to obey this one law. You know what? We weren't really drawing Muhammad anyways, so we're just going to give up our right that we really weren't using, and we're just going to let that go over there, 
and now we'll live peacefully with the Muslims because we won't draw Muhammad, you're living in a, in a delusional world. Because as soon as you yield to that terrorism, they're going to come up with another law that you have to yield to too. You will not insult Islam. You will respect Islam. There is baby steps that are happening all the time, and every time we yield to one, there is another one behind it. So when somebody says, you don't have to, you have to obey my religious laws, the only response is no. The only response can be no. So let's go a little bit on, uh, uh, this is the, the basics, the basics of firebrand atheism. But as we move forward, we have to know some facts, some facts that we need to really internalize. Because when we're doing firebrand atheism, when, we're, when we are atheists, we need to realize that this is not Christian versus Jew versus Muslim versus atheism. This is correct versus incorrect. This is right versus wrong. We have to own that. We may be the minority, but we are factually correct as atheists. And we have to own that. So here are some facts for you to internalize, some truths to remember. The number of times an atheistic argument has been beaten by a theistic argument is zero. In world history, the number of times atheism has been proven wrong is zero, ever. Across all religions, all, you know, they have those, those um, the shows on the, the paranormal investigators and the Bigfoot hunters and the and the and, and well, let's the ghost hunters and they go nine seasons of ghost hunters. <laughs> nine seasons of ghost hunters and they go to the haunted house and they bring all their scientific or related equipment and they detect the ghosts. And in nine seasons, they haven't detected anything provable at all, ever at all. Because there's no such thing as fucking ghosts. <laughs> We need to own these facts. The number of psychics, demons, ghouls, ghosts, or spirits that have been proven, proven real in world history is zero. We need to own the fact that every single miracle is hype. Every single spirit, every single ghost, ghoul, goblin, all of it is hype. If I'm wrong on either of these two points, I will quit my job. That's being recorded. This is going up on YouTube. We need to own this. The number of times atheism has been proven wrong, the number of times anything supernatural ever has actually been proven real is zero in world history. There's absolutely no reason to believe any of that shit. We need to own that. The number of miracles that have actually been proven true is zero in world history. Talk to the Catholic Church, they'll tell you, oh, we've got miracles all the time. Okay, great. Find your best one and prove it. Silence. Silence. I've said this on television. I've said this to all sorts of people. I was in a debate last week and I said the same thing. And he said, oh, I've got proof. I got a doctor and he got a patient and that patient prayed and the cancer went away. Aha. And I said, prove it. Show me the slides. Show me the documentation. Show me that she didn't have any treatment at all for that, treat for that cancer. Show me the miracle and I'll quit my job. And he's like, oh great, yes, I'll get it to you right away. Guess what? Silence. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. I wasn't even scared. But we have to own this. <laughs> the total amount of evidence that separates the myths of yesteryear from today's respected religions is zero. Once again. The amount of proof for Zeus, and the amount of proof for God, and the amount of proof for Allah is equal. Zero. We have to own that. We have to realize that religion and myth are basically synonyms. And that there is no reason for one or the other. And that the reason that anybody believes in anything supernatural is that they are the victims of brainwashing, either at birth or in their later in life, but they're all victims of a lie. They're all victims of a brainwashing, otherwise there would be an iota of proof. There would be a sliver. There would be a thing. But there is no thing. There is no reason to believe one religion over another. There is no reason to believe today's religions over yesterday's religions. None. Point five, in other words, 
and this is the this is the takeaway the sum total of scientifically valid proof for anything supernatural ever anything supernatural ever in world history is zero we fight lies we do not put ourselves on equal footing with religion we fight scams we fight lies we dispute false claims we are right they are wrong we say that even though they say the same thing because we know that everything that we say is in complete agreement with everything that we as a species know to be true we as a species know a whole bunch of set of facts and only atheism agrees with all those facts and theism has a 100% failure rate we are right they are wrong we are true they are false we need to own that because we on a factual level stand on a far higher ground than every religion combined but religion wants you to respect its lies and in fact it demands it it doesn't get respect from me I do not respect religion I abhor it and I invite you to do the same now let's talk about other words euphemisms I have always pushed the fact pushed the idea that atheists should call themselves atheists and not other words meant to detract themselves and I'm going to show you some reasons why I think that first of all atheist as an identifier is the broadest term it's the correct term what does it mean it means the absence of a belief in God in a, a God it does not mean the absolute denial of God it does not it is not an absolute term I am the president of American atheists the hardest line atheist organization in the country when God shows himself I will change my mind if there's any proof ever I will change my mind does that make me wishy-washy does it make me wishy-washy that when Santa Claus lands on my roof I'll believe in Santa Claus too when God shows up and when, when, when Zeus shows up in front of me and he's got a thunderbolt in his arms okay until then fiction is fiction lies are lies it doesn't mean absolute denial to a point of being stubborn atheism simply means we don't have a belief if you are on the fence you don't have a belief you're an atheist there is no gray line you believe or you don't if you don't know you don't believe if you maybe want to think about it you don't believe if you wish there was a God if you like the message of religion but you don't have a belief in a God you're an atheist that's the broadest term no matter where on that spectrum you lie if you're really really conclusionary like me because I've read a lot of books and I've come to the conclusion that gods are myths or if you're completely on the fence but you still don't have uh, all the knowledge that you need and you know it or if you're completely apathetic and never think about religion at all all atheists the broadest term is atheist it's the correct term atheist answers the question about religion I treat people nicely is not I believe in God if I walked up to a vegetarian let's say Jennifer was a vegetarian you look like a vegetarian <laughs> so Jennifer the vegetarian I walked up to, veget to, to Jennifer the vegetarian I say what kind of meat do you eat and she turns around to me and she says I like lasagna that's not answering the question maybe she doesn't want to tell me what she doesn't eat she wants to tell me what she does eat well that's just great but that's not the question I asked my vegetarian friend the answer to what kind of meat do you eat is none I'm a vegetarian so once I had this conversation with a popular person who calls himself a humanist and he says to me I don't call myself an atheist I call myself a humanist because I don't want to tell people what I'm not about I want to tell people what I am about and that's just great if you want to tell people that you're about treating people nice that's just great but if somebody asks you what your religion is 
The answer is atheism, not humanism, because it's not about whether or not you like to treat people right. The question is whether or not you believe in God. And you know it. And you know it. If somebody asks you if you believe in God and you answer another question, you're avoiding the question. You're by definition avoiding the question. This is not telling the truth. This is sidestepping the truth. This is pretending that you've answered the question with I like lasagna instead of saying I don't eat meat, I'm a vegetarian. The answer, the correct answer to what is your religion is not humanism, it's not free thinker, it is atheism because you don't have a religious belief. You are without a religious belief. You are atheistic. Atheist delivers the correct information far more importantly than the euphemisms. Now look at this, look at these groups up here. I'm going to bring up the chart. Now, I don't know if you can see this. Alright, so this black bar indicates a generally correct understanding of the word. Generally correct understanding. The middle bar is unfamiliar and the, the lighter bar is a completely incorrect definition. 87% of Americans, oh by the way, this is data. This is independent quantitative data from, a rely, from an independent source from openly secular. Quantitative data showing that 87% of Americans generally know what an atheist is and about 12-13% of them are unfamiliar with the term. 12-13% to 13 of Americans are unfamiliar with the term atheist. 87% generally understand what an atheist is. And then we go to the euphemisms. Agnostic. Guess what, folks? Half of Americans do not understand that agnostic is an atheistic term. Half of Americans do not understand that agnostic is a secular or atheistic term. 70% of Americans, 70% of Americans do not know that the word secular is an atheistic term. I remember y'all know uh, Openly Secular who provided this, this data. <coughs> they just had Openly Secular Day a few months ago. And they brought out people who said, hey, I'm secular, yay. And you should have seen my Twitter feed with such great worlds of wisdom as, I'm a Christian and I'm secular. <laughs> what? Right. <laughs> and, and secular does not equal atheist. Well, were, they were tweets that people sent to me because Nobody knows what the word secular means. Nobody knows what the word secular means. 70% of this country doesn't know what secular means. Almost 90%, 90% don't know what a humanist is. 90. And free thinkers just as bad. Now let me ask you something. If somebody asks you what your religion is and you answer with a term that you know has a 90% likelihood of being misunderstood, are you telling the truth? Or are you sidestepping the issue and hiding behind a euphemism because you don't want to tell the truth? This should be the chart that you remember forever because nobody understands what those euphemisms are. Yes, those euphemisms are more popular. They're nicer. Could it be that they're nicer because people don't know they mean atheist? <laughs> because if you look at the popularity of those terms, they go down right in coordination with the knowledge that, there's, that they're atheistic terms. In other words, the most popular terms are humanist and freethinker. The most, or I should say, the most positive correlations. And people have no idea what a freethinker is. They have no idea what a freethinker is. They have no idea what a humanist is. So, if you were religion, just think about this. If you were religion, what term would you want atheists to use? Just look at that chart. Answer it in your head. If you were religion, what would you want the atheists to use? Would you want the one that was clearest, or would you want the ones that were really, really cloudy and really, really misunderstood, like by 90% of the country? We have to not play their games. We have to play our game. The game of the truth, the game of honesty. Now, this is a, the firebrand in person. I wanted to give you a, just a couple stories in this slide about using firebrand atheism and how I've used it in my life. Uh, first thing people need to understand is that theists need to know 
that open and harsh criticism of religion is okay. Open and harsh criticism of religion is okay. If we don't do that, if we don't openly criticize religion, Nobody will openly criticize religion. If we don't do it, religion will go uncriticized. Simply criticizing religion, simply calling religion out on its lies is firebrand atheism. And if we don't do it, nobody will. And that's not good for the theist. Remember, theists are not stupid. They're not stupid. So many times people come up to me, I got a friend, he's a lawyer and he's a brain surgeon and he believes in the man in the sky. Why is he so stupid? He's not. They're not stupid. They're injured. They're brainwashed. They're victims. They need to be pitied as they are fought. They need to be understood for what they are. My mother was a theist. She wasn't stupid. She tried to do to me what her, my grandmother did to her. This is brainwashing. This is how it works. Theists are not stupid. They are victims and they need and deserve to know that criticism of their religion is allowed. They need to know it and if we don't do it, nobody will. If we don't attack religion, nobody attacks religion. Even if they find it distasteful, they need and deserve to hear it. My mother uh, died a couple of years ago. Before she died, um, I was in her house, let's go back maybe four years now, and I noticed, now my mother was not a very rich person, in fact she was, she was quite poor in her later years. Uh, I was at her house and I found a receipt from a psychic. My mother was going to a psychic. My mother was paying a psychic. My mother with the limited funds, my almost 80 year old mother, was paying a psychic. And I got mad. And I got in her face. I said, Mom, what the fuck are you doing? By the way, I swear sometimes. <laughs> I'm from New Jersey. You know why people from New Jersey swear so much? Because fuck you. <laughs> so, that's like my favorite joke ever. Um, I got up in my mother's face. I said, what the fuck are you doing, Mom? You're, you're paying somebody to tell you a lie. She says, I like it. I said, you're paying somebody to lie to you. You don't have a lot of money, and you're giving this money to this professional liar, this professional con artist, who is going to take your money and tell you what you already know. No, 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 she tells me what I don't know. Oh, really? Take out a piece of paper and pencil. Next time you go, find out how much she tells you that you don't already know. She says, OK. She went another time, and she brought her pencil. And she jotted down everything that her psychic told her that she didn't actually already know. At the end of the session, the paper was blank. <laughs> and so my mother didn't go to the psychic anymore. So did I do the right thing, or did I do the wrong thing? I did the right thing. Of course I did the right thing. My mother was being conned. If my mother went to a used car salesman and he was selling her a junker for a lot of money, I'd get in her face and say no. I would stop it from happening. And if my mother went to a psychic or a tarot card reader or an astrologer and they said, oh, and she was giving them money for, to, to hear stuff that she already knew, it's the right thing to get in her face and protect your family from a con. Why is religion not included in that list? Why is it okay for a professional liar to go to your mother and say, you need us, you can't live your life without us, I'm going to tell you lies, things you like to hear, things you want to hear, like you're going to live forever, and then you get to give me money and thank me. Why is it okay for that scam? We know it's a scam. We know it's a lie. But religion is on a pedestal in this country, a pedestal on which it does not deserve. We cower away. We shy away from criticizing religion because of this pedestal. We can't sit down and say, well, psychics are, we can, we can debate psychics because of this, but we can't do it for religion because of that. There is no difference. The amount of proof for psychics equals the amount of proof for religion. Zero. So why is it okay? Why is it okay for us to attack psychics and tarot card readers, but not religions? 
If your mother, your father, thinks they are dependent, thinks they can't live without their religion, that's because religion lied to them and told them they can't live without religion. It's a good part of the scam. That's the scam. I mean, can, think about it for a second. They are committed to their religion. They need their religion because their religion tells them that they need their religion. That's a scam. It's not beneficial. It's not good. It doesn't give them anything. It doesn't give them anything that they can't get without lies. It doesn't give them anything that they can't get without trash. So why do we put it up on a, on a pedestal? I say that we don't. I say that we shouldn't. I say that all scams are scams, and they should be treated equally, whether it's Catholicism or Judaism or Islam or tarot card readers or used car salesmen. We have an ethical responsibility to treat our fellow human beings with dignity and to help our fellow human beings out of scams. Now this is a difficult point. This is a hard point because people don't like it when I talk about preaching atheism or proselytizing atheism because that's what religion does. Well, that's not only what religion does and religion isn't the only one that does it. The people who are knocking on your door Sunday morning, they might be Jehovah's Witnesses or they might be Greenpeace. They might be the U.S. Army, they might be politicians. People do that. And that's just because religion does it, doesn't mean we can't. Now, I'm not saying we should go knocking door to door. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that we as atheists have a knee-jerk negative reaction that we need to check at the door. I'm saying that we need to admit to ourselves what we don't want to admit to ourselves. If I walked across the street in the morning, if I just did the stereotype, I walked across the street in the morning, I knocked on my neighbor's doors, 8 o'clock on a Sunday morning, got invited in, talked to the whole family about atheism, and converted the lot of them. You can't deny that good has been done in that scenario. You can't deny that. It feels wrong because religion does it. But you can't deny that good has been done. All I'm saying is that we need to own that fact. We need to own our truth, we need to own our honesty, and we need to own the fact that just because religion does something doesn't mean we have to stay clear of that. Because if we do that, that just kind of helps religion. It doesn't help us at all. Point three, bigotry comes from ignorance. Forcing the conversation allows enlightenment and de-demonizes atheism. Now, when you're talking about de-demonizing atheism, what are we talking about? If you go up to a, uh, a person who hates atheists and they start liking you, and they say, so what is your religion? And you say, I'm a secular, rationalistic, humanistic freethinker. <laughs> and they'll say, oh, that's great. Well, at least you're not an atheist. <laughs> so this is an opportunity lost. This is an opportunity for teaching lost. You could have done work here. You could have said, I'm an atheist. Put a face to the word, a smiling face to the word, hopefully, and actually made it more human, made atheism more human. If you had done that, yeah, maybe you would have gotten some, oh man, oh, oh, oh. but guess what? The next person that that atheophobe meets, they're going to have less of a hard time because you were the first. They're going to have an easier time. So when you call yourself an atheist instead of a something else, yeah, maybe you'll get a little bit of heat. You'll be able to de-demonize atheism. You'll be able to teach a person who needs to be taught, and you'll make it easier for the next person. That is why calling yourself an atheist is humanism. Because there's nothing more humanistic than taking it on the chin for an unknown next person. There's nothing better than making the world a better place, even if it costs you a little, and I'm talking a little bit of heartache, a little bit of service, at most. At most, the response that you're going to get is little, not large. Oh, I don't like you. Oh, now I'm going to leave. OK, it's over, right? You've already done the work. The next atheist that person meets is going to have an easier time. It's done. And you have taught a person. And you have de-demonized it. At least a little bit. That's why calling yourself an atheist is humanistic 
And that is why calling yourself an atheist is activism. Point four. Eventually. Atheists honoring religion legitimizes it in the eyes of the theist, but religion deserves no honor. And the theists, the important part here, the theists deserve honesty without hostility. They deserve it because they're not stupid and they're not evil. They're victims and they need to be treated as such. They need to be regarded as such. Now, I have a friend, his name is Robert. He's a Muslim. And we were at a party, this is going back a couple of years now, I guess. And he said to me, you know, Dave, uh, paraphrasing here, of course, he said, I really respect your religious position. And I said, thank you. And he said, yeah, yeah, you know, you fight with, you know, you, you have your pacts, you have your points, you fight it with passion. And you know what? I, I got to tell you, I respect that. And I said, thank you again. And then he said to me, so now that I've respected your religion, <laughs> you need to respect Islam as well. And I said, no. I said, you respect my position because my position is respectable. I can back up my position with data. You believe in, well, an all-perfect moral pedophile who flew to heaven on a flying horse. <laughs> For some reason, he got mad. So, but, but, but seriously, he did get a little mad. And he did walk away in a little bit of a huff. Did I do the right thing? Well, I could have done the opposite. I could have said, yes, I respect your religion, you respect mine, let's hug it out. And if I had done that, I would have added cement to the pedestal on which religion sits in Robert's mind. Even the atheists respect Islam. That's not helping my friend. That's hurting my friend. That's taking it easier on me, making the situation easier on me. That would have been much easier on me, right? Uh, sure, let's hug, let's have a beer. It's easy. And it would have been harmful to my friend. It would have hurt him, even a little bit. What I said to him made him understand that there is not equality between the positions here. That Islam and all religion is far below atheism. Because atheism is again right by the definition of the word right. Christopher Hitchens said religion poisons the mind. It does. It absolutely does. And if I'm going to say, okay, I respect your religion, I am feeding that poison. I'm letting it sit, letting it fester. I'm not chipping away at anything. I'm not helping my friend. I am selfishly hurting my friend so that I can have a better time. That's not humanism. That's selfishness. That's being mean to my friend. That's bad friendship, at very least. What I did, once again, was take it on the chin a bit. Because the amount of pain that I got from this was, Fine. And he walked away and he got over it. But in the meantime, what he got from me was a lesson that his religion does not have legitimacy from me. What he got from me was a little chip in that pedestal on which religion sits in his mind. That was humanism. That was friendship. That was kind. Now, Firebrand atheism in mass. I like this picture a lot. So, oh, you can't see it, it's too small. Okay, so there's a crowd of people here, right? And you see this little lip on the wall right there? That is the, out, that, that is the extension of a huge auditorium, huge. And it goes all the way back to those back windows in the, in the rear of that. Holds about 10,000 people. In this case, 100% of them were conservatives. This is CPAC. This is where all the Christian Christians go to be Christian about religion and, <laughs> and, and of course, politics, because, of course, everybody in conservatism is Christian. Everybody. Or at least that's what they want you to think. So this is the leading edge of 10,000 conservatives 
after hearing Sarah Palin speak. And they're coming down this hallway toward me. And it's a little hallway, as you can see. And I'm standing in the middle of the hallway holding atheist brochures. <laughs> and I'm wearing a firebrand atheist shirt. I got atheist buttons all up and down me. And this is when I snap this picture. And my heart is going bump, 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 bump. So what we did at CPAC was very, very important. And I'm going to show you the firebrand atheism effect. We were basically saying that conservatism is not just for Christians. But atheist fiscal conservatives by the millions are being pushed away by the theocrats who are trying to equate conservative politics with Christianity. Some of you might not know this, but conservatism hasn't always been Christian. It hasn't. Way back thousands of years ago, there was a guy named Barry Goldwater. <laughs> conservatism used to be secular. And it can be that way again. And the point that we were making is that conservatism has this fiscal area and this social agenda, and that the social agenda is actually not conservative at all, it's theocratic. Anti-gay, anti-choice, anti-death with dignity, this is all theocratic stuff masquerading as conservatism. And when you do that, you push away the people who would otherwise vote for your fiscal policies because they don't want to be second-class citizens. This is the point we were making. So the thing is that, and this was just one of the most amazing experiences, this crowd of people comes by me. They, they walk by me and I'm sitting there, I'm going, why are the atheists at CPAC? Why are atheists here? Atheist conservatism. And they're walking by. And they turned around and they came back to me because that crowd was filled with atheists. Not 100%, not 50%, but a lot, a lot. Turning around, coming back, taking my brochures, thanking me for being there, thanking me for doing this. The Christians who turned around and came back, you'd think they were all in my face, right? I had maybe five conversations that you would think are stereotypical at CPAC. The rest from Christians were that we deserve to be there. We should be there. We should have a table. They supported us. It was amazing and completely unexpected. Completely unexpected. Many Christians we deserved a said we deserved a voice at the table. And look at the results. Now, we've been there twice. The first time they didn't give us a table. The second time they did. By popular demand, they gave us a table at CPAC. Multiple news stories came out this year. Multiple news stories. The, new, the press was all over this message that can, you can be conservative and an atheist. And the, I'll just read these because you can't read them. Uh, young conservative and atheist, a test for the GOP from the Christian Science Monitor. Uh, should an atheist ever be a Republican from Chicago now? Not all conservative Republicans are Christian from the world religion news. This is the stuff that changes things. I mean, think about this, folks. If we can divorce Christianity from conservatism, pie in the sky, I admit. But if we can, we win. We're done. We can fold up shop. If we can do that, we eliminate the driving force to merge church and state. This is a very big picture goal. But if we didn't go, if we didn't find out, if we didn't try, we wouldn't know the answer is that the people who are running CPAC and conservatism are indeed out of touch with their constituents. And that those constituents are waiting, waiting for the old guard to die out so that they can come take over. Atheists in conservatism, they're now waiting for the old guard to die out. We wouldn't have known this if we didn't go in. The fact that we found this out allows us to coordinate a Republican atheists, make them loud. So this last year that we went, I brought two one-gallon bags of atheist conservative buttons. And we gave them away with the one caveat that you have to wear it. 
Okay? You can have as many as you want. You have to wear every one you take. Two one-gallon bags of buttons. Gave them all away. Young people all over CPAC were wearing conservative atheist buttons. Think about that for a second. Think about what that sends. Think about that message. And here's the best result. Tony Perkins, Tony Perkins, from the, from the, Freedom, from the Fam American Family Association, gets up on stage and says, quote, there are those that may choose to be non-religious and that's fine, and the conservative movement is broad enough for them. Now, I want to make it clear. I'm not all giddy that Tony Perkins likes us. I am, however, thrilled that he felt the need to say that. He choked on those words. He didn't like saying those words, but he felt that he had to say it because of all the people at CPAC who were wearing the conservative atheist buttons, who were being out, who were being loud, who were telling the truth, who were being firebrand atheists right here at CPAC in the heart of Christian, of Christian politics. It was an amazing experience. And it shows you that being a firebrand atheist en masse and in, in micro-environments is more effective. If we had gone there as humanists, we would have seen nothing. Because nobody knows what a humanist is. All right. Oh, I mentioned results. I got results. Want to see some data? I like data. I like data. So this blue line is searches for the word atheist in Google in a, in a given month. Searches for the word atheist in Google in a given month. It goes up and down and up and down. And the main reason it goes up is because of press hits. Something happens in atheism, people Google atheist something. And then it goes back down again. And it goes back down to that red line on the bottom, which I represent as the floor. And I represent that as a measurement, a barometer, of atheist normalcy. This is how often people are Googling the word atheist when there's no news about it. And as you can see, it goes up and down, up and down. It always goes back to that floor until Christmas of 06. Christmas of 06, something happened. The God delusion, letter to a Christian nation, God is not great, all came out about the same time. They all went on a massive book tour. Everybody starts talking about atheism, and all of a sudden, there's a big uptick and it doesn't go back down. People keep talking about atheism. Atheist normalcy rises. And it never goes back down. It never goes below that point. Next chart, next part. Now you can see some patterns emerging. You can see an uptick on every Christmas. This is known as the O'Reilly factor. <laughs> That's the war on Christmas. Those atheists are coming to get your Christmas trees and, st and, and, and drown out your Santa Clauses. And after every Christmas, there's a downturn, as you can see. And it goes up and down. There's a nice spike in 07. And then look what happens in 08. That's when the bus ads in London came out. There's probably no God. Now stop worrying and enjoy your life. And this is all stuff that you can research on your own. This is all findable stuff. That was a British event. But it really hit American news hard. And all of a sudden, that line went up again. That floor elevated. And then I end off this chart, right at that little clip right there. That little clip right there is September of 2010. In September of 2010, if you Google September 2010 and the word atheist, you will find two things happened in September of 2010. Number one. The Pew Research came out that said, atheists know more about religion than religious people do. <laughs> That's good. Uh, the second thing is, I was elected president of American Atheists. <laughs> and that's when American Atheists started to do some real firebrand actics, antics, real firebrand activism. And here's what happened. Now, what you're looking at here is Every single spike, every single spike on that board correlates to an American atheist or reason rally activity. Every single one correlates to a, a firebrand activity. And you can see them pulling up that red line. You can see it, You're just pulling it right up. That jump in the normalcy 
is twice as big as the other two and in half the time. Twice as big and in half the time. This is the effect of firebrand atheism. We raised atheist normalcy. And in the book, I give a lot more data than this. I can show a correlation between this and American atheist activity, and I can show a correlation between our activity and our own advertisement. And I can show a lineup between spikes in American atheists and spikes on this chart. They all work. Everything works. I also do a check to make sure that I'm not just seeing a rising tide of all boats. If we see maybe atheism is growing in that term, and so people are looking at it. If that were the case, then we'd see a corresponding rise in humanism and, athe and agnosticism and, and all those, and secular, and none of that happens. All those other terms stay flat. The only term that rises is atheism, and it rises in direct correlation with American atheist activity. And that yields to more people calling themselves atheists. Let me show you this. That's the number of people calling themselves atheists. And what we've got, I'll bring that blue line in. There it is. That blue line slope increases at the same time as people calling themselves atheist increases. People calling themselves agnostic increases at the same time. People calling themselves agnostic increases with atheism, even though people do, don't look up the word agnostic more often, which is interesting, because that lends credence to the idea that people are calling themselves agnostic as a stepping stone term to calling themselves atheism. In other words, in other words the hardline firebrand activism is helping the diplomats by bringing up agnosticism along with atheism. Does that make sense? All right. So a lot of people say, you okay? Yeah, I'm good. All right. A lot of people say, oh, well, we're hurting the movement. When we say bad things about religion, we hurt the movement. Well, I looked. I found no data supporting that. There's a whole lot of speculation. Oh, you're making us look bad. But at the same time that people, that the, for the rise in that blue line, at the same time, we also see a rise in people willing to vote for atheists. So we're de-demonizing the word, just like it should be. Hardline atheism leads to more people talking about it, leads to more people becoming atheists, leads to more tolerance for atheists. This makes sense. It's part of the plan. It is the plan. It's always been the plan. And the data, all the data, all the data that I found supports it. None of the data I found says that firebrand atheism is doing any harm at all. All of the data, all of the data says that firebrand atheism is effective, very effective. Now, here's a summary. So firebrand atheism is more effective than the nice guy approach at causing, the movement on a na at causing movement on a nationwide level. It is also more effective in personal situations because it chips away at privilege and the mythology. This goes back to Robert. This goes back to my mother. Challenging the lies is a good deed, and it's an important thing to do. If we don't do it, nobody will. Truths are important. Numbers are important. And we need to rely on the numbers because we're right. And if we're right, we can rely on the truths. We can rely on our numbers. All religions are lies. All gods are false. All miracles are fake. And those who believe such things are the victims of real lies. That's what they are. They're not stupid. They're not idiots. They're victims of lies, like my grandmother, like my mother, like most of your parents. They're victims of lies, not stupid. Victims of a very malicious scam that we fight as a movement. Firebrand atheism is more effective at challenging religion than the nice guy approach on a micro level and on a macro level. And so it is better for the listeners, and it is indeed the nicer thing to do. This is true even if the listener says it's offensive. Why is the listener going to tell you that it's offensive? Because religion has told them to say that. Because religion doesn't want them to hear your points. They go la, 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 la because they're told to do that. That doesn't mean we should stop telling the truth. We need to tell the truth because if we don't, nobody will. It is our duty as humans and as humanists to fight lies and to help people. And I ask you to consider this. I know 
it feels wrong to talk about preaching atheism. All I'm saying is embrace the fact that religion is a lie and that helping people out of that lie is a good thing, just like helping people out of a scam of tarot cards or astrology. It's a good thing. It's something that we do for them. It's an important thing, too. Nothing beats facts, and folks, all the facts are on our side. That's how we know we're right. All the facts are on our side. There's no mysterious ways in atheism. There's no problem of evil. There's no, well, you just have to have faith. There's none of that shit. All, all, all of the facts support atheism. None, none of the facts that we know as a society support religion. I read recently that there are 20 zettabytes of data in this world. I don't know how much that is, <laughs> but it's a lot. And none of that data supports a man in the sky. None of it. If I'm wrong, I'll quit my job. But I'm not. We have to own that. We have to own the fact that we're right. And that the people who are telling us to shut up are the people who are wrong. And so when we say, oh, I'm not going to upset them, think about what that does. It protects the lie, it hurts the victims, and it keeps the truth in the closet. How in the world is that humanistic? How in the world is that beneficial? How in the world is that even nice? I say it's not. I say it's selfish. I say it's pretentious. And I say it's wrong on a moral level. So we need to use those facts and own those facts. We need to digest those facts. And we need to live in those facts. Because this is not equal. This is not my religion versus your religion. This is not Christianity versus Judaism. This is correct versus incorrect. This is right versus wrong. This is scam versus honesty. And we are the good guys. We wear the white hats. And they're the victims. And they need our help. And they deserve it, too. And that's what I talk about in my book. The, the book actually has a lot more data, like I said, a lot more data showing how well firebrand atheism works. It speaks the truth about religion and its negative effects. And it shows how the major proofs of the existence of God, because you can't write a firebrand atheist manifesto without at least talking about the other proofs of God. Um, the, I, I make the point that uh, the cosmological argument, the argument for morality, the intelligent design argument, uh, and the teleological argument, cosmological and intelligent design are the same. Those arguments are actually all the same argument. They're all God of the gaps. I don't know, therefore God did it. And we need to own that. Because what, what are they? You know, if, if, if I don't know, therefore God did it, is real, well, you can say that for every, every religion, right? I don't know, therefore Zeus did it. I don't know, therefore the flying spaghetti monster did it. We need to own the fact that, that those proofs are just glossed over versions of Neanderthal thinking. Who made the rain? I don't know. God did it. And then the shrinking god of the gaps took over. And now we have the cosmological argument, the teleological argument, the argument for morality, and they're all exactly the same. Where'd they come from? I don't know. Therefore, God did it. Same mentality. Next. Examines whether live and let live is the actual ethical choice. And this is an, I, I want to make sure this point goes through because I'm not saying we definitely need to go out knocking on door to door. I don't want you to go away from this thinking that. What I am saying is that we need to not knee jerk a no, not knee jerk a negative reaction to that. We need to accept that converting people from theism to atheism is a good deed. We need to own that. Even though they do it, we need to own that when we do it, it's a good deed because we're helping people. Doesn't taste good, but when we yield to that doesn't taste good, we help religion and hurt the victims. And we need to own that. The first, all right, so this is interesting. Fire, uh, Fighting God is the first book in American history to be published by a career atheist by a major publisher. This is a big deal because the Religion News Service has already started a report on the book. They're reporting on this book. This book is going to be um, 
well, it's going to be reported on. Um, so, <laughs> so what we're trying to do is hit the Nielsen's. There are Nielsen's for books. I didn't know. But there are Nielsen's for books. So we're asking everybody, if you're interested in buying the book, it is better to pre-order the book. Pre-order it on Amazon. Because that will hit the Nielsen's. If you're kind of sort of interested in buying the book, yes, of course I want you to buy it. And if you wait until like the middle or late December, great, thank you for buying the book. But there's no activism there. There is activism in buying it on a pre-order or buying it in the first wave because that will be reported on. And that will yield to people hopefully being, having an easier time being published later on. That's what we're trying to go for. We're breaking down a barrier here. Uh, I ask you to help me break down that barrier. If you want to buy this book, pre-order the book so that we hit the Nielsen's and make a better story, make a better splash. Um, the launch is December 1st in New York City. Here are some reviews from Richard Dawkins, from Penn Jillette. I also got some new reviews. Uh, Dan Orell this morning published a five-star uh, recommendation for it on Goodreads. Uh, Tom Flynn has uh, reviewed the book. He called it a must-read. So, uh, so far the response to the book has been very, very positive, and I'm very, very proud of that. Um, and that's all that I'm here to talk about today. I want to take a moment to uh, thank Jennifer again for bringing me in, thank the board for bringing me in, and thank you all for coming in this uh, somewhat unorthodox setting. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. So uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them now. Yes, sir. Uh, first, I'm on your side. Uh, I'm an atheist. Uh, my name is Alan Johnson. I've been a sober uh, atheist for 50 years. Uh, You've been sober for eight years for 50 years? I've been a sober atheist for 50 years. Ah, okay, yes. Uh, you you, you uh, make a strong case for the importance of challenging the lies, uh, and that is doing a good deed. The thing that I wonder about is the maturity of folks. All of us have 60, 70, 80 years on, uh, on, on Earth. Mm -hmm. I'd like to get through it with as much peace as possible. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I have a great deal of courage. And because of that great deal of courage, I'm able to do it without God. My parents did not have that maturity, did not have that courageous maturity. For them to have peace, they needed to hang on to, to God. And Who said that? So, uh, Why do you say that? Who says it? Why do you say they needed their God? Because they did not have the courage to live life without God. You can't be a cowardly atheist? Can, be a can you be a cowardly atheist? I, I don't think you can be a cowardly atheist. Oh, I know several cowardly atheists, sir. My, 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 my point is that the reason that you believe that they needed God is because religion told you that they needed God. And they told you that, that they needed God. I don't, I don't give a shit about religion. Well, but, but my point is that you were raised they, in it, right? Yes. They were told that religion is what they need in order to be happy, in order to be at peace. And they believed it. Yes. But the point that I'm making is, as a son, I'm willing, I'm willing for them to uh, be duped in exchange for a sense of peace. I can't disagree with you more. Well, and that's the point. And that's fine. You know, one of the things that we have to realize is that you know, there's a lot of breadth there and there's a lot of nuance. But no, I can't disagree with you more. The fact that your parents were victims of a scam doesn't mean that you have the responsibility to reinforce that scam. Go back to my mother with the psychic. If my mother told me that her psychic told her that she needed that psychic, would that be okay? Would, would that, but I could give her peace. I could give her peace and say, okay, mom, let's have peace. Give your money to the psychics. Go with the scam. Is that the right choice? Maybe you think yes, maybe I think no. I strongly think no. I think that lies and scams are bad. And I think that as we respect our parents, 
part of that respect comes from not assuming that they're cowardly, but by assuming that they're victims of a scam, a brainwashing scam that has impacted their lives negatively, made them dependent on a lie negatively. I would contend that your parents were not cowardly. They were injured and that they needed your help. And I would contend that you didn't give them the benefit of the doubt. You assumed cowardice. You assumed need because they said that. But that's a big assumption. And I think that if I were in that situation, I would have acted differently. If I were in that situation, I would have taken that shit down. And I believe that it would have been much better for my parents than letting them sit and be duped in an exchange for peace. It's just a difference. Sir. Yeah, so I'm... Um, oh, before we get started on the question, I just want to make a point. Uh, we're not into uh, getting a uh, argument here or anything. We don't have the time. So rather, if you just make a question and then listen to the response. All right? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm a firebrand atheist, I'm an uh, axiological atheist, I'm an anti-theist and anti-religionist. My question for you um, is that it seems like you're saying firebrand atheism is anti-religion, which is fine with me because I am anti-religion. But I'm just going to the question, do you also see that as anti-religion or is that just you think that part of atheism? No, it is very definitely anti-religion. Okay. okay, firebrand atheism is anti-religion because you recognize that, athe that religion is a scam. Right. Yes. Okay, so the, 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 the first part here is the, is, is the recognition that we're not equals, that that's not okay, that, being, that, that it's a scam, it's a lie, it's a con, and it's bad. Uh, so that makes me an anti-theism person. And uh, I'm just going to detract for just a second to the point of, to the, to the, to the word anti-theist. I never use the word anti-theist. And the reason I never use the word anti-theist, and I used to, is that an anti-theist can be an anti-theistic person, or it can be a person who is against theists. It can be a person who's against theism, and it can be a person who's against theists, an anti-theist. So uh, what I have found in my experience is that when you say I'm an anti-theist, not only do you once again answer the vegan question, the vegetarian question, you're talking about your attitude toward religion, uh, but you're also potentially calling yourself uh, an anti-human person, an anti-theist person, as opposed to an anti-theism person. So I never use the word anti-theism without that explanation. Having said that, I'm very anti-theism. Theism is evil, if there is an evil. It's wrong, it's a lie, it's a scam, it's a con, and yes, firebrand atheism launches off that because that, that's where the humanism comes from. It's good to replace the evil of the lie. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Good. Sir. Look, you spoke about secular being akin to atheism or being a form of atheism and, and being, in fact, atheists. Now, one thing that I have had people throw in my face up before for the time, and how I would want to know is that whenever I thought about secularism, I never really thought it was atheist, it was just anti-theistic, because if I say it's atheist, then I s sort of equate it to what the Soviet Union was, right. and get into that equivalency, and s but yet, in my mind, American <coughs> secularism is far in a way, much different than the Soviet Union's way. But how, so, so how do you square that circle? So the first thing that you need to realize is that the, the linkage of atheism to communist Soviet Union is a theism device, okay? It was made during the Cold War uh, as an attempt to make godless communism bad, and they found that's where we got on God we trust, that's where we got one nation under God, it's a device by religion, okay? So yielding to that is yielding to that, okay? I, I don't want to do that. Um, the other thing about the word secular is that it doesn't necessarily mean atheist, okay? That tweet that I got, I'm a Christian and I'm secular, in certain definitions of the word secular, it's correct, okay? Because secular simply means separate from religion. So if I say I'm a secular person, that kind of does mean I'm an atheist. 
But if I say I support secularism, that does not mean I support atheism. It means I support the separation of church and state. And you can do that as a Christian or a Jew or a Muslim. So when you're talking about that chart that I put up, that only 70, only 30 percent of Americans know what secular means, this is this that's the important point here because people get confused. They don't know about it. They don't understand it. So when you say, well, I'm part of the American secular movement, you're going to have a whole bunch of Christians that are wanting to be part of it because nobody understands the word. We have to use the word that people understand. And yes, there is an association with communism. And that's too bad. We have to eat that because 87% of the country knows what an atheist is. It is the grammatically correct word and it is the most efficient way to deliver the message. It has a, a negative connotation because of religion, and we have to fight that. But the only way we can fight it is to take it head on. If we use a euphemism that's misunderstood by 70% of the population, we have a much larger and more difficult road ahead of us. Back, yes. I have a, okay, as, as somebody who has a lot of uh, family members who are religious, uh, I've always been sort of a live and let live person listening to this, I realize, hey, you know, I'm not being honest with them. How do you recommend opening up the conversation in this way, you know, with, with your religious family and friends? Great question. Thank you for ask, asking that question. So um, the first thing that you ask is, do you have any family members that agree with you? Uh, do you have any family members, maybe a sister, an aunt, someone? Anyone. First question to ask. I don't know if it's you or not. Now I'm just speaking rhetorically. The first question to ask is, if, is there anyone that you can get on your side, okay? Go to them first. If you have an aunt, a sister, a cousin who's into science, that's where you go first, okay? And you try and build up a base. Sometimes you're not gonna have that, but if you can, you build that up first. The next thing to do is talk about science. Talk about what they've discovered with science. Talk about how you find facts. And then, when it comes to church, say, I'm not going, I'm an atheist, and then immediately change the subject immediately change the subject. I'm an atheist, I'm not going, but you guys can go. I'm going to go watch baseball. Did you hear the Red Sox are playing the Yankees? Blah, 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 blah. The important thing, there are lots of important things, and I, I, there's an appendix in the book about this uh, from an article that I wrote a long time ago. Um, drop the news. Do not be embarrassed or ashamed at all. Do not couch it. Don't come out. Okay? Don't sit them down and say, I have something to tell you all. <laughs> I'm an atheist. Okay, now beat me up. Okay, don't do that. Okay? Drop the A word. Change the subject. Keep it happy. Keep it light. Let them come after you. If they come after you, have some nice answers ready that you give while you're smiling. Make sure that they know that this is not something that you've decided on a whim. This is something that's been around for a while. It's not a phase. Just to be clear, when you say drop the A word, and you mean mention it rather than omit it, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Good thing you interrupted me there. <laughs> say the A word. Yes. Say the A word. New Jersey comes out. Yeah. Say, say the word atheist. Don't say a word that they won't understand. If you say the word that they won't understand, if you go with secular or humanist, you're not going to get any reaction at all because they don't know what it means. Okay? Say the word atheist, smile, be positive about it, be proud of it. If your parents get upset, one thing that I've said uh, that has gotten a lot of traction is that, uh, to tell your parents that um, the reason that you're becoming an atheist, the reason that you are an atheist is because they've raised you right. It's because they've given you the strength to, to see through some things. That they've given you the strength to go on your own way um, and thank them. For, for raising you correctly so that they can raise a strong and healthy child into a strong and healthy adult. That's a good thing, that's good parenting, and it's something that needs to be praised. Um, a lot of times... Even if it's not true. What? Even if it's not true. Even if it's not true. Correct. Even if it's not true. That's a little lie that you could say it's okay. Um, so tell the truth most of the time. Um, <laughs> the... the um, Ah, uh, now I lost my train of thought. Um, the important thing is not to be ashamed. The important thing is not to be sad. 
The important thing is to show them that you're proud, to show them that you've made this decision over time, it's an educated decision, and that you love them, and that you're happy for them. A lot of times I've heard the story, and you know, your, your, your results may vary, but I've been an activist now for 20 years. I've heard a lot of coming out stories. And I would say, I don't want to quantify, but a lot of times, people come out to their parents, and their parents come out back. Because the parents were faking it for the children. Or the parents were faking it for each other. It happens. Okay? And this is why you need that base. This is why you need another person with you. Because that'll be more likely that they'll come out to you if they're not coming out to just one person. Yes, Jennifer. Um, so I love to debate people. I am very strong about who I am and everything. Um, I even debated my parents, pastor's wife and everything. And when it comes down to it, the only argument they have is what if you're wrong? So how do you respond to that? Mm. How should I respond to that? Because that's all they have at the end. That is all they have at the end, the empty threat of what if you're wrong? I'm making an empty threat to you. What if you're wrong? Pascal's wager. Pascal's wager. And it is the worst argument out there. Pascal's wager, the, the big flaw to Pascal's wager is that there's only two choices. Okay? To be my way or your way. What if you're wrong? Well, what if they're wrong and what if you're wrong? What if it's Zeus? What if it's Thor? What if it's Quetzalcoatl? What if it's Allah? Okay? What if it's Vishnu or Krishna? You know, the other Christ, Krishna Christ. Pascal's wager depends on Booleanism, our way versus your way. It's not that way. There are thousands of gods, thousands of religions. All of them would use the same argument against you. They would all use Pascal's wager. In my book, I actually propose a new religion. It's called Silvermanity. <laughs> Silvermanity is a great religion. Okay, Silvermanity is a great religion. Uh, you should join. Uh, all you have to do is give me lots of money and do whatever I say. If you do, if you do, when you die, you go to super awesome heaven, which is much better than regular heaven, and you bring all of your dead relatives to super awesome heaven with you. But if you don't, you go to a place called super worse hell. In super worse hell, they have an ocean of fire, not some measly lake of fire. And if you go to super worse hell, all of your ancestors and descendants are pulled out of heaven and sent to super worse hell too. <laughs> so that's worse than Christian hell. So use Pascal's wager and follow me. It's the same logic. It's the same logic. So the, the, the real key is the pluralism of the options of, of Pascal's wager. The pluralism, the number, of go, uh, the number of gods. There are thousands. And any one of them could be right but all of them can use Pascal's wager as a defense. Yes? Uh, speaking of your book, an audio version, who's going to do the reading of it? Me. I already did it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> What's your favorite podcast? What? What's your favorite podcast? Ardent Atheist. I like Emery Emery a lot. He's a good guy. Uh, I like uh, Seth, of course, as well, the thinking atheist. So, yeah. Those would be my two. Yeah, I was wondering, um, I'm actually in a tough field. I'm in the field of sales, believe it or not. And in this area, which is very, very religious, I deal with a lot of clients who will volunteer that they are Christians, that the Lord has been good to them, that they wouldn't have maintained their health if they hadn't been saved by Jesus Christ, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I'm an atheist, but I cannot confront them. I mean, if I were to follow your philosophy and confront them, I wouldn't be able to eat. And that creates a great dilemma. I also would have a hard time telling my coworkers that I'm an atheist because it would create a fairly hostile work environment. So how do you recommend advising somebody in a like myself? I do write about this in the book. Um, I think coming out at work is and should be your lowest priority. Yep. Okay? The, I, I've, been, I've worked in many offices. Re religion's, not, religion's not important there. Um, it's not your job to convert. I mean, yeah, on an ethical level, you want those customers to, to free themselves, but you don't have nearly the responsibility to do that as you do with your friends or your family. Right. Um, you have more of a responsibility to put a roof over your head. Exactly. Now, I would definitely advise against lying and saying that you're a Christian too and going to church and faking it. That's living a lie. That's a very, very, that's a very awful way to live. Um, but I would suggest not coming out. You know, coming out is something that you do for yourself as well, right? 
and you know, come out to your friends, come out to your families, be an outed atheist in your place. Right. But when you go to work, just get the work done. Just, just sell your stuff. You know, get, get the work done, get the paycheck, come home. And if somebody asks what your religion is, you can just say, well, I like to keep my religion personal. Yes. Move on. Right? That's it. Okay. That's it. This isn't the place for that. Okay. We'll talk about that another time. Yeah. This, is my, this, is, this is something else. Like yeah. <laughs> Sir. That's right. Yeah, that's true. Sir? Uh, you're probably aware of the woman in uh, infotainment named C.E. Cup. Yeah, S.E. Cup, yes. S.E. Cup. Yeah. Uh, and she'll always start out, she's on a panel or whatever, with the declaration that I'm an atheist. Yeah. And then she'll come out with something that I feel is asinine. Yeah. Like the latest thing I heard. Mm. But I wouldn't vote for an atheist president. I want someone to go home and think there's an invisible God in the sky. Uh, is, would you recommend anything, an individual like myself, or even like the American Atheist as a group, could do? Uh, I, I almost feel, I, I compare her to uh, like a white person putting on blackface to pretend to be a black person. The, the analogy that I made in Fighting God is a black person, uh, the, the Uncle Thomas blacks that Malcolm X used to talk about, the people who would um, say, yes, we black people deserve to be treated poorly. Yes, thank you for giving me this job. And, and, and they would basically get well-paid jobs among white people. You're next. They would get basically high-paid, well-paid jobs with white people. Um, and their, their principal position would be to reinforce the stereotype against black people, which I really equate to what SE Cup is doing. So um, the distasteful part is that she serves a purpose. She, remember I said, if you call yourself an atheist, that next person, that atheophobe is going to be less inclined. Well, if you're uh, a conservative Christian SE Cup fan, and you meet an atheist, you're going to have less of a negative reaction because you've got exposure to a person who's an atheist who agrees with you. I don't like anything that woman says, except I'm an atheist. <laughs> so, you know, it takes all kinds. And, you know, it, I don't like what she says, but the fact that she's an outed atheist on Fox News and she takes a position that theists will like has utility. And as much as it makes our bile bubble up, we have to accept that. Madeline Murray. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> well, Madeline, Madeline Murray O'Hare was, was, you know, she had her own bile. She had her own stuff. She didn't do what S.E. Cup is doing. No. But there were a lot of atheists who disagreed with her, too. Yes, sir. I was just going to express a concern. I worked for the Boeing Company, and there was an article on the paper, on the, on the. Um, Speak up louder, please. Oh, there was an article. I worked for the Boeing Company, and there was a article on the bulletin boards, and it said there was no freedom of speech at the Boeing Company, and that's true. Yeah. If you do not say, if you say something that is not liked at the Boeing Company, you can be discharged. Yeah. Same thing at American Atheists. What? Same thing at American Atheists. Yes. So if you are, I don't know if it, this person was a doctor or something working in a group. Or this, this person over here is a salesperson. Yes. Salesperson. So salesperson. Yeah. If he is working with a group of salespersons and he says something uh, about somebody else and that person complains about it, then he is liable to get fired. Yeah. So that's what the, you got to protect your, protect your income. Just protect your income and deal, and deal with your personal stuff on your personal time. That's my point. David. Uh, Islam seems like such a big thing. Of course, Europe and everywhere. Um, uh, Minnesota is going to become a Sharia state, I guess. Can you just comment on the danger of Sharia Muslim in the USA? I don't think it's real. 
I, I mean, I, I don't think it's real. I mean, they're going to have to have a constitutional amendment to do that. The only thing that they're trying to do is they're trying to make little Sharia sections of, of Muslims, and the Jews are trying to do it too, to say that, that this little section is governed by religious law. Um, one lawsuit is going to kill it. Yes. It's, it's, it's completely illegal. It's totally unconstitutional. So the real danger of Sharia law in America, I think, is zero. I really do. Well, Texas and about 15 states have... You can sign an agreement to arbitrate everything according to Sharia law. Yeah, as, as long as you don't negate your own constitutional rights, because you cannot negate your own constitutional rights. So as soon as any lawsuit comes up where a person is, being, is losing constitutional rights inside that, you know, it's going to lose. You cannot sign away your constitutional rights. So I don't see it as a real threat. I see it as hype, or a lot of hype. Sir. I'm kind of curious. <clears throat> Do you think the uh, uh, atheism or, or, uh, <clears throat> is on the ascendancy? Do you think it's going up currently? Or do you think it's going down? It's going. Especially with religion? It's going way up. Okay, we are the fastest growing religious demographic in all 50 states. We are the second or third demographic in 48 states. The second or third demographic in 48 states. So. Uh, it's rising, and it's rising with the young, most definitely. Uh, a chart that is not on this, but is in the book, uh, talks about the fact that statistically, the older you are, the more religious you are. And that trend works. That trend is solid. So the 40 to 50 year olds are more religious than the 30 to 40 year olds are more religious than the 18 to, 20 year, the 18 to 30 year olds. Um, but you don't change religion over time. That's not the question. This is a snapshot. So as those 65 plus people die, uh, the average is going to be pulled up. I make a case in Fighting God that the number that we use right now, that we see in atheism right now, is between 3 to 5 percent. The real number is close to 30 percent. 30 percent and rising. And religion is failing. The only reason that the Catholic Church is not completely evaporating is because people are converting to Catholicism in places where there is no internet, in places where there's no education, the converts and the imports. In America, religion is dying and is dying fast and good riddance. Uh, and, and, you know, there are some young people here uh, and they're going to see it happen in their lifetimes. Uh, they're going to see atheist normalcy in their lifetimes and maybe you and I will see it. Can I hear some applause for that? Yeah. <laughs> so let's do uh, two more questions. Sir? Um, how do you uh, justify applying the term lie in, in the sense of the lie of God and, and the lie of religion when many people, I mean, I've been an atheist for over 50 years, I think it's certainly false and not true, but when people believe it and say it, uh, they're not lying, they are wrong. Yes, and, and this is a, a very important point, because there's a big difference between telling a lie and lying. There's a difference between telling a lie and lying. Telling a lie can be done unconsciously. Lying cannot. So I don't tell people that they're lying unless I say something like, if you get asked about your religion and you answer with a term that you know is going to be confused, you're lying. But if you say there is a God, whether or not you believe it, you are telling a lie. And that is direct, definitionally, that is sound. And I back that up in the book. There's a difference. And it's a subtle difference, I know. And I've gotten, gotten asked that question quite a few times. The reason I use it is for firebrand, for firebrand effectiveness to make sure that people understand that it is a lie. It is not my truth versus your truth. It's truth versus a lie. God exists is a lie. And if you know it and you tell it, you're telling a lie. If you don't know it, you tell it, you're telling a lie. That's different from lying. Lying means intent. Telling a lie does not imply intent. And I back that up. Yeah, the de definitionally, that's sound. Last question here, I think, yeah. was this Does the Church of Silverman and the Church of John Oliver and the televangelists <laughs> and the other churches all take advantage of 
the same IRS exemption? <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful question. Uh, $79 billion a year goes to property tax exemptions. $79 billion, uh, 71, I'm sorry, $71 billion a year go to tax exemptions for churches. That is the equivalent of seven Morgan Stanley bailouts per year. That is over a million cops. That is over a million teachers that could be paid. Yes, a million cops, a million teachers versus those tax exemptions. Oh, we're fighting that tax exemption very, very hard. There's, there's an IRS code. There, there, there's, a, there's a chapter, there's a, uh, an if-then statement in the IRS code that says, if you're a religious institution, do this. If you're not a religious institution, do that. We're going to try and force the IRS's hand on that because that is religious discrimination by definition. It's religious discrimination in the code in black and white. And uh, it is illegal and un-American, and we're trying to fight it at American Atheists. That's one of our major pushes. It's a very complicated law. It's a very complicated thing to do, to do but we are fighting it. And uh, the, church, the Church of Silver Manity does not, is not a 501c3 nonprofit organization, but um, interest, interestingly, there is a church in Nevada, the Church of Bacon. It is a real church. It is a real church. It is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. They do marriages, they do weddings, I'm sorry, they do funerals, and they pay their taxes, and they don't take donations because that's how churches are supposed to be, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. So, folks, I want to thank you again for coming and listening and, and, and in, this, in this unorthodox, pun intended, setting. Um, uh, I'll be here. Now, again, uh, there are membership forms in front of you. And there are Fighting God flyers in front of you. Please pre-order Flying God, F Fighting God, <laughs> Fighting God, Flying. Fl please, it's been a long day already. Uh, please pre-order Fighting God. Um, please join American Atheists. And while I'm talking about joining American Atheists, let's talk a little bit about the Tri-County Freethinkers. Tri-City. Tri-City Freethinkers. <laughs> Which now I regret should be tri -county. the new logo because it should be Tri-City Atheists. But. It should be Tri-City Atheists. <laughs> Folks, um, everybody here should be dues-paying members of Tri-City Atheists. Okay? <laughs> everybody. And I'm not making any exceptions. Okay? Um, local organizations need your support. They deserve your support. If you get utility out of the existence of the organization, it's the right thing to do to toss them a few 20s and be a dues-paying member. They have a lot of, uh, they put a lot of effort, Jennifer's been putting a tremendous amount of effort into bringing me here, and she's unpaid. And this is volunteerism, and this is activism, and it deserves your support. So please chip into American Atheists, but also chip in for, for Tri-City Freethinkers, because they need it too, and they deserve your support. Thank you. Thank you. All you. Thank you for that plug. It is true. Um, again, thank you to everyone for you know uh, being accommodating here. And uh, I was flustered earlier, and I forgot to say I wanted to thank Michael Paracci here from WSU. Thank you so much for for hosting this. I am curious how many students of Michael Paracci's are here. Three, three students. Cool. I I, I hope that. Uh, I hope you find the extra credit well worth it. Thank you for coming. Um, and everybody, thank you so much for coming. And oh, over here, uh, one of the things that had to be kind of redone is there are sign-in sheets. Now it's going to be maybe a sign-out sheet. But if you would add your name to that, um, I would love to know that you were here. Uh, there is a place there that you can leave your email address if you want to be included on our mailing list. Um, Everybody's going to sign up. I hope Everybody's so. Everybody's going to sign up. <laughs> Everybody's getting on the mailing list because it matters. It counts. <laughs> Thank but you. So, I don't have <laughs> uh, oh, so you know, I do think you are officially our highest uh, attendance for you. Yeah. Oh, well, that's great. Thank you, everybody. You beat Sean Faircloth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're like, of course I did. So. Anyhow, uh, if you have any questions, you can seek me out. I'll be here for a little bit, uh, and you can find us on the website. My email's on there, and I hope to see a lot of you. I see a lot of new faces. I hope a lot of you will start coming to our, our meetings and other functions. So thank you, everybody. Thank you.